big hello and welcome to everyone who's joined us um just to say a huge thank you um for taking part in this morning's launch of the reasonable accommodation partnership and um, passport in partnership with ibec and ic2 it's so great to see so many people engaging in this subject it's um just really really exciting time i think in this area um my name is claire hayes and i'm the interim director with employers for change and so in the interest of inclusion and accessibility, I will give a visual descriptor of myself. I am a white woman. I have short blonde hair. I'm wearing a black and white polka dot dress and glasses this morning. And I'm sitting in front of Employers for Change virtual background. So I've got the Employers for Change logo on my right and the employersforchange.ie, which is our website, to the left. I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you joining us. Um, later during the seminar, we'll be joined by a fantastic panel who will be discussing their knowledge and experience of implementing and using um, a reasonable accommodation passport. But before we begin to discuss reasonable accommodation passports, I wanted to note just some of the housekeeping this morning. Um, we've switched the live captioning on, and if you'd like to utilise that function, please do. If you have any questions you'd like to ask the panel today, please use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So this is a really important piece that if you do want to submit a question, that's where we'll be picking them up. Sometimes they get a little bit lost in the chat. So we'd love to be able to hear some of your questions this morning and that they get asked. So please do use that. If you do have any other comments, please throw them in the chat. That's great to see them in there as well. But before I invite our panelists to join me, um, I thought it would be beneficial for us to start today's seminar by hitting on some of the key points around reasonable accommodation and what they can look like when implemented at work. So the Employment Equality Act of 1998-2015 places an obligation on employers to provide an employee who has a disability with reasonable accommodation. So this is referred to as an appropriate measure within the Act. The reasonable accommodation is something that helps to alleviate a substantial disadvantage due to an impairment or medical condition. The purpose of providing reasonable accommodation is to enable a person who has a disability to have access to employment or to participate and advance in employment. It is a way of move, removing a barrier or creating equity within the workplace. Employers must also make accommodations to enable people with disabilities to return to work having acquired a disability, as well as to participate in the job application process and enjoy benefits and privileges accorded to their other employees. I think an important stat to note here is that 70% of people with a disability between the ages of 20 and 64 acquired their disability after the age of 16, so during their working life. Understanding reasonable accommodation is hugely important from an employer's perspective. If you have to make a change to the workplace or work practices to accommodate a disabled employee, the demands should be reasonable and should not impose a disproportionate burden on the employer. So in other words, the changes and the costs should be realistic for the business to bear. And this is dependent on several factors. So it's the nature and the cost of the accommodation requested the overall financial resources of the employer and the number of employees and the impact of the accommodation on the operations of the business. However, I think it's really important that we acknowledge here that accommodations are more often than not inexpensive or have no costs at all. Research carried out by a head found that over two thirds of accommodations related to work tasks do not incur any costs whatsoever to the employer. Items that did incur costs were readily available within the organisation. Some examples of a reasonable accommodation could be considering alternative ways of doing tasks, providing company information in appropriate formats and assisting in communications, maybe introducing captioning on your meetings, um, which is readily available now within Teams and on Zoom. It could be considering accessible facilities, perhaps adjustable height desks or hands-free telephone sets, and even providing quieter office spaces. Assistive technologies such as Read, Write, Gold or Grammarly also would be considered reasonable accommodation and actively remove barriers for people with disabilities within work. So we've considered and looked at what it, we mean by reasonable accommodation and some examples um, that we could consider. And we'll take a look now just really quickly at some of the steps 
that we can implement as employers or as managers or as people leaders within our organizations when we are providing reasonable accommodations. So assess the essential functions of the job and determine whether or not support is required to fulfill those. The person with a disability is the expert and knows what barriers, if any, will exist for them in the workplace. Identify the employee's workplace accommodation needs by involving the employee who has a disability in every step of the process. They are the expert. Exploring ways of providing workplace accommodations, using job descriptions and job profiles to analyze essential functions of the job. Consulting with the individual to ascertain the precise job related functional barriers and how these could be overcome with potential accommodations. Maybe the individual has a hearing difficulty or is perhaps deaf and they might need email and video call to be the primary method of communication. Um, and with captioning or if they lip read, it's important that colleagues are not talking over each other or covering their mouths while, while speaking. Deciding if and how co-workers who may be affected by any of the proposed accommodations will be informed. Implementation. Of the most Implementation of the most reasonable and effective accommodation that is also the most appropriate for the employee and employer. Remember, accommodation selected should be effective, reliable, easy to use, and readily available for the employee needing the accommodation. Review the implemented accommodations with the employee. Over time, special provisions may no longer be needed or required may change, requirements may change. So an employee should advise their line manager of any changes that are needed by providing follow-up, by modifying the accommodation and or repeating the steps outlined above, if appropriate. So this is where a reasonable accommodation password can become incredibly helpful, incredibly beneficial. And we'll touch on that in a little while. So under reasonable accommodation funds, the Department of Social Protection can also help you as an employer to take appropriate measures to enable a person with a disability to have access to employment by providing the following grants and schemes. So the Workplace uh, Equipment Adaptation Grant. This assists available, is assistance, it's available for employers, employees, and self-employed disabled people who need to adapt the workplace or purchase specialized equipment for staff with disabilities. It can include minor building modifications, such as ramps or modified toilets, um, perhaps alarm systems with flashing lights, um, and even equipment ad adaptations, such as voice synthesizers, for computers or amplifiers for telephones. This maximum grant is of 6,350 um, euro and is available towards the cost of adaptations. The grant can also be used to upgrade um, already previously adapted equipment. There's also the personal reader grant. Um, if you're blind or visually impaired and you need help with job related reading, you may be entitled to a grant to allow you to employ a personal reader. So this grant is only paid if you're employed in the private sector. The government will pay an hourly fee in line with the current minimum wage and it will be paid for an agreed period of 640 hours a year. The job interview interpreter grant. So if you're a job seeker who is deaf um, or maybe hard of hearing or has a speech impairment um, you're, and you're attending a job interview with private sector employer, you may be able to apply for funding to have perhaps a sign language interpreter, a lip speaker, or another interpreter attend the interview with you. You can apply for funding to also employ an interpreter for each job interview you attend. And you can also get further funding to cover the cost of employing an interpreter to help you when you start a job. So during your onboarding and um, reduction process. The employee retention grants. Um, this scheme assists employers to retain employees who require an illness, condition or impairment, which has impacted their ability to carry out their job. So funding can be provided for the following, identifying accommodation under and training to enable the employee to remain in their current position, um, retrain the employee so that they can take up another position within the company. Application forms for these four different grants can be accessed through the Department of Social Protection's website, as well as your local intro office. We also have a section on the Employers for Change website, and we have section with further information on application processes and requirements. Um, and you can find that on our website, including some of the forms as well. So I'm just finishing up on these couple of slides now, 
and I've kind of flown through an awful lot of information around reasonable accommodation, but I am excited for us to get stuck into the panel discussion and kind of to chat more about what a reasonable accommodation passport looks like. But some key points that we might consider and take away today is reasonable accommodations must be provided under legislation. Um, accommodations often have no cost to an employer. It's very important when implementing accommodations that we listen to the individual. They're the expert on their needs. A reasonable accommodation is an effective and a practical way of creating equity in the workplace. So I've spoken about what reasonable accommodations are and what they can look like. Um, I'm going to invite our panelists to join us on screen where we're going to discuss the value in using a reasonable accommodation passport as part of this and what this can look like when we implement it. Now I'd like to welcome everybody on screen there today. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start off with Samantha Owen. So Samantha is Social Policy Executive for IBEC. Cara was due to join us, but unfortunately couldn't make this one, but we're delighted to have Sam here in her stead. Um, so Sam, I'm just going to start off with, can you tell us a little bit about the reasonable accommodation passport? I'm actually going to pop now just for everybody a chat into the link, um, a link into the chat the way around, and you can download the reasonable accommodation toolkit from this link here, so you can have a little flick through it later on after today. So sorry, Sam, can you tell us a little bit about the reasonable accommodation passport? Absolutely, and um, we were warned beforehand, so I'm going to give you my visual descriptor before we head into all of that. Um, so I'm also a white woman with long blonde, dark blonde hair, I suppose, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a mustard sh um, shirt that you can't really see, and um, I'm sitting in front of a blurred background for anyone. Anyone very interested in what I look like today? Um, and so thank you so much for having us on today, Claire. And, um, Sorry for anyone who's very disappointed that they don't get to see Cara McGann today. I know she's a fan favourite with everyone. Um, but the, it, it's amazing work that herself and David have, have done on the, the Reasonable Accommodation Passport. Um, so what it is, because um, I know there, the, these accommodations are already happening. And as you said, there's an obligation under the Equality Act to have them there, big and small. Um, so that kind of work has already been done. And what the Reasonable Accommodation Passport does is it's a live, confidential and collaborative document that allows the employees and employers to speak together on kind of what's needed for those accommodations um, and what I mean by that because I know that's a lot of jargon there kind of is so it's it's collaborative in that an employee with a disability knows their own disability better than anyone else I wouldn't get into David's car and say Claire how should I set this seat up so that David's able to to drive that's not really how it works they know what better and they know what they need so they'll come in and, and they can discuss what's what's required What's, what their day-to-day -day is, what the barriers are in place for them, and, and that conversation will happen. And then a line manager will meet them with a can-do attitude that says they understand that that's happening because a lot of these accommodations are easy, and if they're not, they, you know, there's, there's ones that can, that can be made, or there's, there's funding that can be available for it. And that's put into that document, so that's signed and agreed. And it gives a reassurance to everyone that as you move forward, whether, you know, you're, you're changing roles, you get a new manager, that that's there in person and your accommodations are, are, are in place um, for everyone. Um, and by live, we mean that you know, your a disability can change, the technologies that support them can change, um, and you know they can, they can improve, they can fluctuate, that, that they're there and they're checking in, and that can be triggered by the person with disabilities, or it can be triggered you know, in, in six months that you're checking in with the employee to make sure the accommodations are still working um, and that, you know, that, that, that you're there happy with how that's happening. And then by confidential, we mean that the person with a disability has disclosed their disability to allow this document to, to, be, to be shared. That doesn't mean it's shared with the organization widely. It is shared with the person they're speaking to. So when a new line manager comes in or they change roles, that will need to be agreed again to allow them to share it. But having that there gives them the reassurance that the organization understands them, they have listened to them, and that they can move forward with the employer and understanding that they know that it's simple accommodations that can be put in place to allow them to do their jobs effectively. That's great, Sam. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to move to David. So we're delighted to have David Joyce from IC2. Um, with us today. David is head of uh, the quality officer. So David, can you tell us a little bit how ICTU and IBEC came together on this document and what was kind of the foundation around this? Sure. Um, thanks, 
Thanks, Claire. Um, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, as Claire says, I'm I'm David Joyce, the Quality Officer with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And uh, in the interest of inclusivity, I'm a white man. Um, I'm wearing a blue shirt and glasses, and I have a lot less hair than all of the other panelists in this uh, discussion. I'm sitting in front of a virtual background, which is an international trade union campaign called Time for Eight, the eight being the Sustainable Development Goal 8, Decent Work for All, which of course is very relevant to what we're, we're, we're talking about today and is part of the reason we came uh, together with IBEC um, on this particular um, initiative, because uh, as you know, um, Goal 8 of the Sustainable Development Goals states that by 2030, which is creeping up on us, um, uh, you know, we will achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, including for young people and persons with disabilities. So um, we are kind of halfway through almost the period from 2015 since that was agreed and um, to, to think can, can we obtain it. And we know there are serious um, challenges ahead um, uh, in, in that. Um, so um, I, I suppose what we hope is that and what we hoped in terms of uh, approaching IBEX uh, with this um, uh, idea was that we could through you know together um, uh, make a contribution towards um, tackling the the serious um, kind of underrepresentation of people with disabilities in 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 the labour market. Um, so we have a very tight labour market at the moment, as we know, but. Um, you know, still one third of disabled people are unemployed. Um, the ESRI has highlighted that only 36% of disabled people are working, and this is the fourth lowest rate of employment for people with disabilities among the EU 28. So a, a scheme like this could play an important um, role in, 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 in tackling um, that. Um, I suppose, um, you know, in, in, in recognition of, of all of that, um, the integration of reasonable accommodation, and I don't need to go into what that is now because Claire gave a very um, detailed description at, at the start of our, our meeting on, on what's involved in, in reasonable accommodation, but, but um, the integration of, of reasonable accommodation into recruitment and employment um, processes can play a really important role in in addressing um, the, the the issues of the underrepresentation of, of people with disabilities in in workplaces, um, for us we came across the passport scheme through our um, sister organisation in the UK. The TUC um, had done a lot of work um, through their um, disabled workers committee and some of their affiliates um, to create the kind of model. Um, passport. They also um, spoke with their Equality and Human Rights Commission, as did ourselves and IBEC when we were putting ours together, just to make sure that we were compliant with um, legislation, etc. Um, and also we spoke to our um, disability committee in, in Congress um, as well. Um, the, the, the difference, I suppose, from what happened in the UK and what happened here was that Early on, we said, wouldn't it be great, rather than us launching this solely on the trade union side, if we could approach IBEC and see, could we launch it together? Because obviously, um, together, you know, we, we, we have a much stronger, um, uh, you know, reach um, in terms of not only unions and their members, but also the, you know, the vast number of employers that, that IBEC um, represent them as well. And, um, you know, we, we were, we, uh, car, people have mentioned CARA, uh, myself and CARA spoke about it and, um, you know, approached uh, um, the leadership on both sides and there was, there was absolutely no, um, no, no um, resistance to, to the idea. So um, on, on December the 3rd in 2019, um, we, we kind of launched um, the, the scheme. Uh, and of course, we all know the world turned upside down shortly after that. 
And so today's relaunch um, with, with Employers for Change is a really welcome uh, development because um, it, it, it provides us with an opportunity to kind of put it out there again and to, for those who haven't heard of it up to now, to perhaps consider how they might use it um, in, in, in their workplaces um, as well. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I was going to talk about reasonable accommodation and what is what's involved but you know i i think claire has covered that really well um and we can you know you know leave some time for for q a um just let me say that the the national disability disability authority has done some research into sort of common barriers um to a kind of seamless reasonable accommodation including issues around disclosure um lack of policies and procedures um, failure to respond to requests for accommodations in a kind of timely manner uh, and low awareness, as I think has been mentioned, regarding the whole area of reasonable accommodations and the types of supports that are um, available, and also then a lack of follow up regarding um, implemented um, accommodations. So, I, I guess just to finish for now, I'd say that we hope that the passport can help in tackling um, these barriers so that workers can become more comfortable in disclosing their disability and requesting reasonable accommodations and employers are then enabled to you know respond in, in an effective um, manner. That's great Eva thanks so much and sorry for Robin some of your speaking notes on you there. <laughs> um, hi Gillian a delight to welcome Gillian McMahon from hi, Claire. UK, Ireland and um, Gillian's the head of HR and you have a BT Ireland implemented a reasonable accommodation passport as a very effective measure and we wanted to invite you actually on today to kind of talk about your experience because um, the hope would be that just people on this call employers on this call today who are considering how they can introduce this and we'd love to hear about your experience um, in using this amazing initiative. Yeah, great. And, th and thanks, everyone. And good morning. Um, I'm to, to explain maybe how I look on the screen. So I'm a white woman in my 40s, not getting any younger, unfortunately. I have short blonde hair. So there's a lot of blonde hair today. Um, I'm sitting at my desk working from home today. Um, and so this is a topic that's of particular interest to me because I actually um, declare with a disability, I have an invisible disability due, due to a degenerative back problem. So I don't have a visible disability, but that's actually an important aspect, which is maybe to lead into, which is many people in the workplace have many disabilities of varying types. And it doesn't mean everybody needs to know about it or doesn't need to mean you need to wear a badge nearly to explain it. But, you know, everybody has their has their own maybe uh, struggles in life, whatever that may be. Um, so maybe if I could mention, Claire, I suppose what, about what BT has done. So BT, I, I work for BT Ireland um, and the HR lead for, for a business of about 650 people um, and we have employees all around Ireland. But we're obviously part of a larger, um, the larger BT group, which is a very, very large organisation of, of circa 100,000 employees. Um, and BT was actually significantly ahead of its time, it seems, um, in this area. So I've been in BT um, about 10 or 11 years now and BT has had what they, what they brand the BT passport. They've had that in place as long as I'm in BT, actually even longer. So it's actually in place so long, I actually can't find who actually implemented it because I think they, they probably don't, no longer work in BT. But BT um, originally launched what they call a disability passport. So it was about the disability and the reasonable accommodation that's required. And then over time, they've act, they actually, a number of years ago, um, broadened it, which is maybe another thing that we could talk about on the call today, which is, you know, I'm, I know Employers for Change are all about um, helping people with disabilities, and, and I'm, I'm very keen on that as well. But actually, if you're going to implement something, you might actually, you know, kind of kill two birds at one stone and, and implement it maybe for a broader range of things. So, for example, um, and I think one of the questions there in the chat was, you know, is there a template? I think you, you'd be circulating the material so people can log on and see the template we have a very similar template but it actually covers um, I suppose a broad range of things from either kind of a medical issue and um, that you might need to make your, your employer aware of what to do in an emergency things like that or how it impacts you it could be a disability it could be a family and um, kind of caring issue I suppose it can be absolutely anything so in other words anything that an employee would like to document with their manager that facilitates bringing their whole selves to work, whatever that may mean. It might mean flexible working. It might mean they have to leave early every week to bring an elderly parent somewhere. It can be absolutely anything. And then it kind of evolves into then actually what is that reasonable accommodation and how do we accommodate the person um, in their role. Um, so I might mention, and I'm happy, Claire, you, you, you jump in at any time if I'm uh, talking for too long. Um, 
as I know we, we're, we're dying to take questions from the audience, but um, I think in terms of implementing it, so the difficulty with the passport, if I'm frank, is so lots of things under DNI, right, are, are underway and BT, you know, different to anyone else. So though we have the passport, we still have a long way to go on, on, on the journey, right? And and it can be slower than, than you would like, unfortunately. So I think it's a case of identifying some key tangible actions as a business that you could do you know, each quarter, each year, and then making real progress and getting done. So this is something really good that I think every employer could easily implement. As you say, doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily cost anything to actually give a reasonable accommodation. And certainly, like I'm I'm over 20 years working in HR, I've never had to apply for a grant. I've never had to, you know, I suppose go to that extent to provide an accommodation. So I would agree with with your the research that you quoted, which is vast majority of reasonable accommodations actually just need a bit of thoughtfulness from the employer, a bit of consideration maybe for you know, and and maybe notifying co-workers and you know why somebody might need um something different to everybody else maybe around them. So I think it's it's to me it's 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 generally a fairly free and easy thing um, to implement just needs a bit of flexibility and a bit, a bit of thoughtfulness. Um, so in terms of implementing it, I think it's kind of a, a slow and steady, um, I suppose, maybe project that you might implement. The difficulty that I was going to say is that because it's not something like I'm, I'm in HR where we love things to be measured. We like to know, you know, how many people are using a passport. I suppose the, the, the nuance here is you don't know how many people are using it, but that's actually the good of it, right? So sometimes confidentiality and kind of having something for the greater good of people is more important than measuring it. So that's the only thing I'd say is it is difficult to measure its success because you don't log it on a system and go, Gillian has a, has a reasonable accommodation passport or whatever passport you implement. You just have to let it evolve organically um, and just, you know, make sure people are aware, maybe at every opportunity, once you launch it, it could get forgotten. So it's kind of just about maybe constantly drawing people's attention to it. If you have any kind of DNI activities or, you know, coffee mornings are absolutely instant, just always maybe reminding people that it's there, along with lots of other good things that I'm sure many employers in the call would have. So availing of OH, uh, occupational health services, um, and employee assistance program, EAP, or whatever well-being supports you might have for people, always good, I think. That, that my, my advice would be to just always remind people and um, that it exists you know have it in your documents if people are out sick you know, or they're coming back to work maybe having had a period of sickness you know making sure it's in your instructions for somebody returning to work as well so it's just maybe using every opportunity to remind people that it's there i pause there then for claire for <laughs> you may have yeah no that's great actually i ha i do have a question and it's probably i think it's directed to Julian. Um, just now I want to know when is the passport available to employees? So is there kind of a probation period that has to be completed by or does BT allow an employee no. to engage at whatever so we, we we have it at any point. And I suppose just if you maybe think back to the start, like I think it has to be really uh, there's no sorry, not that a passport has to be available or you know um from from the outset, but it's probably good to have it because you are legally obliged to provide an accommodation for interview and the hiring process if that's required. So, for example, if that's somebody, something that somebody needs to actually make it through the interview process or selection process, um, it's probably good maybe to then pick it up from there. And I think then if somebody joins your organization, I suppose, you know, at the outset. Now, lots of people don't require an accommodation at interview. So I think it's really important as your kind of induction and onboarding process then um, to make sure it's there. Like, look, what, you know, one thing I would say is things... Um, and I realize, listen, lots of people have different policies around probation. You know, it, at the end of the day, I think if somebody needs an accommodation, they need it from day one to make their probation period successful. Because yeah. sometimes what you find is people maybe are nervous to declare and maybe it's not always about uh, disability. It could be about any kind of your diversity characteristics. People are nervous to, to declare their data and by not doing so actually makes their life can make their life very difficult and um, because they feel they can't be their, their kind of true selves. So I think opening it up, my advice would be open it up from the start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now, if, for example, maybe there's a significant investment required, obviously, look at that would need to be required, you know, sorry, reviewed case, case by case to see, you know, if that's something maybe, maybe you wouldn't want to maybe, and I'm, sorry, I'm not trying to make it about money, but you might not want to spend a significant amount of money if the person maybe isn't going to stay on longer term. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's a chicken and egg. If you don't do it, the person isn't going to be successful. So it's all about being inclusive and integrating everyone as much as we can into the workplace and making it making it somewhere for everyone to work. That's really great. Hope Thank that you helps. so much. Yeah. Um, Dave, I actually might just ask you quite quickly, just from a um, point of view from ICH2, what is the role of trade unions within this area? Um, I'm just aware that we might have some people on the call from ICH2 who might be interested in where they can play a role in this. 
Sure. Um, well, uh, I suppose, first of all, we, we represent, um, a, a, you know, a, a proportion of our members would uh, be disabled people. So we represent disabled people. And it's important that, um, you know, in our work, um, our day to day work, that their needs are, are part of our, um, you know, collective bargaining agenda as well as um, uh, everyone else. So in terms of then what, what unions can do, I mean, unions can, for example, um, negotiate the use of reasonable accommodation passports with employers. So, you know, get a, get a scheme uh, in place. It, it doesn't, you know, it can sit alongside uh, an already existing disability policy um, you know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to replace anything in that sense, you know, um, it, it can, um, I, I, as Gillian has said, you know, um, unions can play a role in, in encouraging employers to promote the, the scheme amongst uh, all the, all the staff um, as well. Um, and then importantly, they can also support um, members of just completing their passport if, if, if needed, you know, ensure that they feel they have covered everything they want to include and that the accommodations that are um, agreed um, will minimize the kind of barriers that they face, you know? Um, and, and, and that, you know, that will help to reduce kind of stresses and anxieties that people might have. And, and of course, in, in, uh, improve their performance as well, you know? Um, and, and of course, union officials and workplace reps could be available to accompany people in any discussions they might be having with their uh, line manager about their passport um, and, and, and can help in terms of following up with them to check that any agreed um, accommodations have been implemented, et cetera. You know? So that, that's sort of some of the things that um, unions can, can do in relation to all of this. That's great. Thanks so much, David. There's just two kind of questions that have come in here that I just want to acknowledge and probably should have said at the start. So one, um, we have Claire who says that the light see Gillian on the call and to have a panel for the disability and were disabled employers and employees consulted in the design of the passport. So the way employers for change is run that is that we're informed by a strategy group which is made off made up of disability stakeholders as well as employers. Um, with like we about have it and IBEX in it as well. So all the work that we do is informed by these different key stakeholder groups and organizations so to ensure that we're doing the most effective and practical things so I guess the answer to that is yes and then just Jerry um, mentioned um, on the call that or in the chat here that that we're looking at the way we're talking about disability and comparing to impairment that we're not using the UN CRPD um, and a good passport will address all needs not just medical conditions and have we considered using the medical versus social um, model and disability. And so the, dis the reasonable accommodation passport is um, underpinned by the social model of disability. The presentation that I was speaking with there, because the legislation uses that language, we just touched on it there, but the reasonable accommodation passport is underpinned by the social model of disability. And I think maybe a couple of people missed it, but if you scroll up in the chat, I've popped the link in there for the news and events section on the Employees for Change website, and you can see the reasonable accommodation passport there and download it in PDF um, if anyone is interested. So Sam, just from Ibis perspective and your own, we've kind of touched on widening out what reasonable accommodation passport looks like from just disability. Do you have any further thoughts on that that you'd like to add to kind of that discussion? Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on one thing I saw on the chat there, um, and it was around what happens if people don't disclose. Mm -hmm. um, and we we recently had Sky in Ibeck, and they were talking about that kind of disclosure a bit. And it is important to understand that there needs to be a culture of trust um, before people will disclose. And I know Gillian touched on that as well. Um, but from, from Sky's perspective, they kept saying that what people wanted to see from them was when their data was was passed on and they did give that trust to give their data that they wanted action, that they wanted to see that when they were disclosing things, that then the employer understood and took action with that. So it is going to be slow and that we are going to, to have to see um, 
kind of that change happening and that maybe other people who are more nervous will have to see that other people are supported before they get on board. So that's that, that's just to, to get to that one. But with um, the kind of, um, from our perspective with employers, it's to kind of give a bit of reassurance because accommodations are happening all the time, whether it be for people with or without disabilities. And I know we were talking about the call before the call that um, I, I always kind of think that if you if you had a county footballer playing uh, or uh, working for you, they might be training twice a week and then have to leave a bit earlier. God knows they're always they're always injured and they're off with a physio or they're doing whatever. And it's kind of thought, geez, yeah, of course, they, they're off and they're doing this. And they are reasonable accommodations. They are reasoned accommodations, not falling under reasonable accommodation. And they're happening with everyone. And maybe that's because that's for their well-being, that's for work-life balance. And then this is just to empower them to work in another way because that's a disability opposed to an obligation under, under football. So to, to kind of remind employees, because I think sometimes it feels daunting, but a lot of these accommodations are the same. And the accommodations that you, you might make for people with disabilities is the same as you might make for someone just for productivity. Or, you know, uh, for, I use Grammarly every day, even though I don't have disability, because it just helps, you know, just in case you're, you're missing things. So a lot of these accommodations might seem scary, but, you know, you are making them. And I think everyone on this call is more than capable of, 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 of speaking and, and using that empathy to, to support everyone. Absolutely. I just look at I always think when we discuss reasonable accommodation in the back of my mind, I always just think this is just good practice. It's just best practice, you know, not covering your mind to the cause in case somebody is lip reading, you know, not talking over each other. And I think we all had to learn a lot about that over Zoom as well. But a lot of the reasonable accommodations that I've come across and that we've spoken to employers um, in at Employers for Change, they're all really practical and effective steps that just remove barriers um, and so important. Um, Jillian, I was just wondering from your perspective, because obviously we're talking about reasonable accommodation, Sam has just touched on disclosure, we've had a question about disclosure. Is there anything that you've seen that's worked really effectively to really encourage and nurture that culture of disclosure within an organization. Yeah, I have well, I, I can only talk really, I suppose, about BT. So, so um BT, I suppose I'd maybe focus on BT in the UK, right? Which is ultimately where it's headquartered. They have really good declaration rates. And I think so there's two things. A, a you have to have the right culture. So so an awful lot of these things is about culture, culture of trust. And that trust has to work both ways. Um, but so, so BT, um, and the, sorry, and the second thing I'd say is it takes time. So you don't just go out and go, hello, everyone, please declare your data. And suddenly everyone declares it. It is something that has to kind of evolve organically. So BT Ireland um, hasn't done, I suppose, what I would call a declaration campaign. So in other words, going out to remind people, you know, please declare your data. It's, I think what's, what's beneficial, and I suppose I have the benefit of being part of a large, large organization, we are actually able to anonymize that data, but actually I don't even see it. Now, I realize that's not, that's not maybe possible in every organization, depending on your structure and size. So but either way, I suppose you have to limit who can see that data. So obviously, look at people in HR can see lots of data, but I can't actually see individually who is a disability. I can't see ethnic, you know, your ethnic minority, your background, your race, anything like that. I don't need to because actually it's not really my business. It's not anyone's business. But it is good to know, I suppose, what your starting point is as a business to be able to see actually where do you need to take action? In other words, do you have a lot of people with disabilities and you need to take more action there? Do you, you know, do you have? not enough people with disabilities, you need to actually promote yourself as an employer more to attract more people with disabilities and explain that you will make reasonable accommodations to attract people. Because, you know, David mentioned a very, a very shocking statistic about how many people with disabilities are unemployed. And, and I really just don't see, see the need for that. And I think I think it's a real shame. Um, so I think in terms of declaration, like BT Ireland, we went out and did a data declaration campaign last September. And it was the first time doing what I'd call a campaign, as in really trying to get in front of people and, and do it. It did increase the numbers, but I think what I've learned from the UK business is you have to keep doing it over time and, and it will gradually increase. Um, but I suppose what I'm finding from feedback from employees, there's kind of two, two kind of schools of thought. One school of thought is people don't want to declare because they feel they'll be discriminated against. And I don't think they think there's no reason for them to say BT is going to do that. Just generally, I think in the workforce, people are hesitant. Um, but also there's a group of people that kind of say to me, we just don't feel the need to declare. What does it matter? So it's actually really hard to kind of try and kind of work that dynamic for everybody. But I think what we're trying to explain is we'll look at the more information we have that's confidential and anonymized, 
the more we can try and actually help people a that are in the business feel more included but also attract more people and um, that may otherwise not not apply so it's, it's kind of kind of trying to approach it from all angles but it does take time so I think but the only thing the only thing about a passport is that doesn't I don't feel that requires somebody to disclose maybe officially to the business as in tick a box on a system I think it could it doesn't necessarily require disclosure I think the the, the goodness of it is is that it's a confidential conversation with their manager so as so I suppose that's really the key is maybe really honing in on your management community which ultimately are managing your business every day and their relationship with people really needs to be spot on, you know, culturally good, you know, allow flexibility, allow reasonable accommodations so that actually a person in their team will at the very least discuss it with them on a confidential basis. So I kind of feel like in relation to passport, you could probably separate disclosure um, and people can still have the passport, still actually have assistance from their manager at the very least. That's true. I actually that, have a question. Helps, yeah. yeah, I actually might have another question on my point. Sorry, David, did you want to come in there? Just, just very briefly, I think, um, Gillian made a, an important point there in terms of disclosure. Um, uh, I mean, pe people are people are rational beings, generally speaking, I guess, um, and uh, they will in their heads go, "Well, if I disclose this, what's going to happen?" You know, and if they see a culture where um, you know reasonable accommodations are provided and people uh, continue to be able to participate in the workplace on an equal level with um, you know with their with their counterparts. Um, yes, you will get people beginning to think that, yeah, okay, uh, disclosing in this environment is not going to hurt me or hold me back in any way, and therefore I'll do it, you know. Um, so it's, it's really important that um, the culture is right, because um, people will only disclose if they feel it will be to their benefit, you know, if they're worried about discrimination or whatever, um, you know, they, they, they won't, and that's just the, the reality, I suppose. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think one of the things that we would say a lot at Employers for Change is about being quite explicit and open as well and being quite clear that if somebody requests a reasonable accommodation, like you're willing to provide it. And I think um, stating that and being public about it, I think creates a sense of confidence, I think, in individuals. Um, Adele, I had a question on, I might point it towards Gillian if that's okay, because I, I think it might be the most applicable to you and she's just asked is it assumed that all accommodations are permanent or is there an allowance to review as skills develop no so i don't i don't think you would i think so that i think that the nature of the passport which i i, I imagine is covered off somewhere in the in the in the nice toolkit claire that, that you're that you're going to um launch um i think um you know, the, sorry, the, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I have a few thoughts in my head, but the nature of it really is that, it, that it's evolving over time and that it does change. So I think part of the, maybe when um, if somebody, whoever asked the question, maybe wants to look at the template or we, you know, if anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm more than happy to, I, I've, I've helped a few other employers recently who are thinking of launching it just because IBEC was aware. Mm -hmm. um, so more than happy, if anybody wants to look me up, um, more than happy to help. But um, I suppose the, the way the template is set out or, or whatever way you might like to set it out is kind of what's the accommodation um, maybe, you know, is it required permanent? So, sorry, could be a permanent thing. So, is it required permanently? Is it temporary? Maybe what's the duration for review? So, it's always important to come back and review it, or you might need, you know, further guidance from occupational health, for example, if if it's something that requires medical um, advice. So, so no, I think um, I think it could be both. I suppose so. It depends on the on the nature of the disability. Yeah. Um, but even at that, things change over time. Um, or somebody might, you know, they might have an additional difficulty, or something might improve. So, I think you just need to be flexible on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and and again, Again, maybe just have a touch point or for the manager to review it you know in three or six months time check in is everything going well and if it is fine if it's not redocument um, and kind of take a note of what's required so I think it's just probably case by case but it could be either temporary or permanent yeah yeah I definitely think that um, points to what Sam said earlier on about the document being a living document that yeah. it's kind of a one and done um, and I think the importance of implementing and introducing policy around this where there is a structure in place where you're assessing implementing but there's also the review that are these reasonable accommodations still applicable are they still helpful are they still removing the barrier that the individual is, is, is experiencing um on that sam i don't know now if you'd be able to answer this but i'm going to go for it so sorry if i put you in the spot but we just had a question are you aware of many organizations who are working with people with disabilities and have included this password 
or any passport, I suppose, as part of the system. I know obviously you've got Julian here today from BT Ireland and they've done incredible work. And I'm just, this individual we're wondering, is it much broader? Are we building toward it? Yeah, we're hoping that more people have used it than have come back and, and told us about it. But we've we've seen a good few employers come back and they've either implemented it just for people with disabilities, they've implemented it for people with disabilities and caring responsibilities and just to understand how different people are working. So it's a flexible document um, that even some employers have tried to, to introduce across the board to understand how each person might work different, differently and how they can accommodate each person to work effectively. So there's a lot of different employers that, that have used it kind of and, and applied it how it would be best to their organization. So it, it can be taken and it can be adapted. Um, and we have seen a, a lot of employers um, to, to use it to to the, the best of their, their, their abilities. I think it's kind of as with all of us, it is case by case, isn't it? Like each individual need is different and the same applies to an employer. An employer, if you're an SME, you have to be, realistic about what you can do as an employer as well um, and to meet your employees reasonable accommodations. I am aware we're coming up to kind of the end of today's session. Um, I just want to double check with my the panelists do all of you have so much knowledge and I want to make sure that there's nothing that we've missed out on that anybody would like to add today. If I could just add one thing, sorry, just as in something that BT has started doing recently that I, that I just think is really useful and certainly in the context of maybe helping people to clear and, you know, getting good word of mouth out amongst your, your um, employees. So BT have st started doing what we call internally, we call them belonging listening sessions. So in other words, you put an invite out um, kind of to a wide audience and uh, they started doing it around ethnicity. So we had an ethnicity rapid action plan, kind of you know, all followed on the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and now we've evolved that actually to, to move into the space of disability. And just I attended one myself recently and it was kind of a small group. So in other words, you have somebody who's maybe, you know, I suppose aware maybe of, of accommodations that need to be made or trying to um, increase the number of people with disabilities entering the workforce or whatever your, your objective might be. So basically kind of you have somebody moderating the call, maybe like yourself, Claire, today, and you invite people on who want who have they don't all have to have disabilities but generally seems to be the people who sign up have a disability small group seven eight maybe ten people and um, you, you have very strict rules around confidentiality and you know you don't attribute anything mm -hmm. said to the people afterwards or, or tell others you know who said what or anything like that but it, I actually found it really informative so you could do that for many different things it doesn't even it doesn't have to be about disability you could do it on other topics but it's just actually maybe to one of the questions that came in in the chat is you know have we involved people with disabilities it is really important to involve people that that are experiencing whatever it is themselves mm -hmm. and they just give you such nuggets of of information or lessons learned or you know where things could be better you know it's always worth asking people with disabilities what could we do better for you mm -hmm. and you know you might think you've done everything and then actually they might have something really good and um, to tell you so just might be useful maybe for just some people on the call to actually just maybe have some confidential listening sessions to get or round tables to get feedback directly from different groups whatever whatever your topic of interest might be that you want to try and improve on yeah, I'd absolutely agree so, with that, Julian. Yeah, I think it's great, yeah. there's no point developing documents and not considering and consulting with people. And I would agree with you yeah. wholeheartedly on that. Sam, are you, do you want to come in there? Yeah, <laughs> just sorry, just on, on the document, I know there was a couple of kind of questions on if it's in plain English. Um, and and I think when, when it was written, I'm sure um, everyone wanted it as consumable as, as possible. But between you know, IBEC and employers to change um, and David, everyone is willing to answer questions after this session. If if for any reason there's anything there that you're kind of thinking, what in God's name are they talking about there? Come back to us. We're, we're happy to work with anyone to make sure it's as easy for you. And if you kind of any questions about how you could change for your organization, contact Claire Hayes anytime with day or night. No, <laughs> but um, do contact IBEC ICTU or, or employers for change. And we're happy to work with anyone to, to make it work for their organization. 100%. And Matthew, I just saw that Angela had asked what training should be given to managers to support the passport in discussion. Um, and we, at Employees Change, we do offer disability awareness training. We can set up a video call and have a chat through what the passport looks like and the best way to kind of implement that and introduce it to your employees um, and the teams. Um, so we're more than happy to echo what Sam said, we're here to support, we're a disability information service, but if the question is not even in the area of disability, we are always happy to signpost to somebody who's better equipped to help and support as well. 
David, would you like to have any closing comments? Um, not, not much to add really, Claire, other than to say, um, yes, of course. I mean, we'd love to know who's, uh, who's using it and if there are people using it out there, how they're getting on because, um, you know, you, you, you work on something like this and you launch it into the world and you kind of hope that it's useful and that people will take it up, et cetera. So it's great to hear, um, you know, the likes of BT's story today. Um, uh, so look, anyone who is either thinking of doing it or has done, done it and wants to share any experiences, we'd be delighted to, um, to hear, hear from them, yeah. And thanks to Employers for Change for providing the platform today to uh, promote it again, you know. No problem at all. That's great. And I do I think it really speaks to the ethos of you know the reasonable accommodation path where we're we're taking the onus off the individual to remove the barriers for themselves and replacing it on us as employers, as team members, as team leaders, as people leaders, as managers within the organization to remove barriers for our colleagues who have a disability so that we can have more equity within our workplaces. So I think. We've kind of covered a lot of, um, oh, we do actually have one question, sorry, Colm. I can just see a question there, the chat just popped up. It's actually a really, really good question. Um, and it's in relation to employees in the third sector, so the community charity, not-for-profit, what supports are available? Now, maybe when the panelists might correct me if I'm wrong on this, but as far as I know, all the um, funds and grants are directed specifically only for private sector employers. Um, and I was wondering, do you use, perhaps Ava or Sam might be able to speak to this, know of any extra supports that are available to the third sector, to the charity, to not-for-profit organisations? Um, as, as far as I'm aware, um, I, I think it's the, the same supports available, um, but um, yeah, that's, that's I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure either, but I'm sure this is something that we can, we can come back to in the follow-up and make sure that any kind of links or clarifications are there. Absolutely. That's great. I just want to also say to tell everyone that we have recorded today's session. We will share the recording. We'll record the link has been sent into the chat where you can download the PDF to the toolkit. I'll share any of the slides as well that I used this morning in case anyone wants them later on for reference. Um, I can't thank the panelists enough today, Gillian, David, Sam. It's so wonderful to have such incredible people involved in today's session to have your experience and your knowledge and to have your contribution as well and I'm really really grateful for it um, I just want to say a huge thank you to all our attendees to on a Monday morning to log on and to be engaged in such an important topic it's so heartening to see um, and so with that I'd say a massive thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day and have a great week thanks